let's talk specifically about Black Marsh now. Mr. Payne indicated uh, the location of uh, Black Marsh, as you can see from the east side of Fredericksburg. You refer to it as sort of the snoopy nose in the river. Um, this area that's shown in uh, green there highlights that uh, it's uh, 571 acres, excuse me, 541 acres, of which 372 within the special exception. 38% of that area is in buffers. All of the land is agricultural. It's all open space right now. There will be no trees or anything else removed. Those are agricultural fields, and there will be no wetlands impacted. This is a, uh, a quick overshot of the uh, special exception area. As you see, about a 370, 72 acres. The plant site is in the lower center of that. That will be 14 feet below grade of the existing grade out there. We are um, give you some distances that will come in uh, and be important as we move through this presentation. Distance to hop yard to our special exception line is about 1,350 feet, 4,500 feet to our plant site. Berry Plains is 1,000 feet to the special exception line and about 2,500 feet to, uh, to the plant site. The closest Caroline residence to the south, just below the property line there in which the berm is located, is 1,150 feet to the special exception line and 2,800 feet to the plant site. Haymount, which is over 6,800 feet to the special exception line, and about 8,400 feet to the plant site. This is a view from the middle of the river looking back toward um, the property. And um, if I can get this to work. Well, if you look right through the middle of the gap in the uh, first... Uh, In the middle of the picture, if you look through the gap, you'll see a tree line in the back. That tree line is the middle of the pro basically the middle back of the property. Our plant site will be below and behind that particular tree line. This is a barge at our Pocomoke operation in Maryland. I'll show you an existing operation. This is the same image superimposed on Black Marsh. And as Mr. Payne indicated, we will be using a telescoping conveyor system, so that's the, uh, the, the visual impact that you will see from, uh, from the river. Uh, we have a, a very narrow cut in the tree line, and we have supplemental plantings associated with that. Some misconceptions that are out there about Black Marsh Farm, we thought it was important to make the board aware of those, and we'll run through these very quickly. Sound. We did an extensive study, which is part of the application materials. The background community is 50-55, and, and, and the sound levels at our special exception line will be at or below 50-55. And why is that important? Sound drops at least 6 dBA with each doubling of distance. So if you go from 50 to 100 feet, 50 uh, with 100 to 200, and 200 to 400, each of those doublings, it drops 6 dBA. At 400 feet from our permit area, the projection is less than 40 dBA because of that doubling impact. What does that compare with? That's the types of sounds that we all are associated with or feel or are familiar with. That puts it in context. Conversational speech in a quiet room is in the 50, 55 range. Marine, 17 captains, 9 mates, over 400 years of experience within that crew. We operate, as I've shown you in the earlier map, throughout the Chesapeake under very strict Coast Guard rules. So some questions about the movement on these particular types of river systems. As I indicated earlier, we operate on very similar systems, very similar configurations. The speed of a typical barge in those systems is one to three knots. Very slow. And you'll see that these are no wake. There's also been some reference to the Seaman Porter case, and any time there's an accident, it's a tragedy. And we feel for those people involved in that. But the facts that were found by the U.S. Coast Guard in the, in the National Transportation Safety Bureau was that this was a nighttime military exercise by inexperienced crew without the training necessary. And basically, those two entities found Vulcan, found clear Vulcan of any fault associated with that unfortunate accident. 
national statistics that have been thrown out about tug and tow. Well, to put this in context, we've not been able to find the statistics that have been reported in the paper. Uh, but recreational, we got over 47 accidents and 736 with the last year that have been reported. If you look in the high category for tug and tug, that is related to any injury, any reportable injury, not just fatalities, but any, a total of 69 of those nationally with all the freight that's moved in the United States. This is what a tug and a tow looks like. Single barge that we move. This is on the Pocomoke River in Maryland, very much similar riverine system. What do you see in this picture? You don't see a bow wave. You don't see anything else. It's a very slow moving process. This is taken from a public dock on the back end of it. As you can see, again, a very slow moving, essentially still water environment. And we're talking about where do these particular barges operate. This is the Occoquan River. We've talked about this material going up to our facility at Woodbridge. The uh, blue circle represents a sales yard that we have there. And you can see throughout that approach into the Occoquan River, there's a number of marinas and other commercial and, and uh, recreational traffic. We've operated in that environment for over 40 years. This is another one in Sunset Creek and Hampton area. Another sales yard in the left in the blue. There's a marina right across the waterway from us. And you can see all the docks and other marinas in that immediate vicinity. And when talking about safety, our tug crew has actually recently recognized for recovering a, a young woman that had jumped from a bridge. And we were recognized by the Coast Guard in Hartford County and City, City of Havre de Grace for that effort. A commendable effort on the part of our crew in being able to enhance public safety. And when we're talking about safety, we've got operations in our footprint that have over 40 years without a lost time accident. When you talk about incident rates, I know that you all are familiar with the OSHA and MSHA categories. And I can tell you that the higher is worse, the lower is better. That is an exemplary safety record for our division. We're also talking about health. That's another issue that's been brought out. We've had an industrial hygiene program in place 20 years prior to it was ever required by a regulatory agency. I'm very proud that U.S. Secretary of Labor at that time, Robert Reich, recognized Vulcan as only one, two, one of only two companies in the U.S. to have a silicosis prevention program. That's the other thing that's been brought up is silica. And was it, is there a potential occupational health hazard? Well, we can say definitively that that is not the case. Silica is an occupational disease and is not present in the general population. That is well documented in the literature as well as from people like Dr. Hans Wheel, who is a professor of Tulane School of Medicine. But Dr. Wheel's got over 30 years of experience investigating respiratory health effects of workplace exposures. He's published over 200 scientific and medical journals that were used by OSHA, NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety Health, and EPA in setting occupational health standards. And he's also st served as chairman of the Pulmonary Disease and Advisory Com Committee for the National Institute of Health. Also, Dr. John Parker, in addition to being professor and chief of pulmonary and critical care medicine at West Virginia University, he has spent 10 years as NIOSH's Division of Respiratory Disease Studies. These documents are included in part of your application materials that you've been received. And more importantly, Dr. Parker commented in his letter that he would not have any hesitation for himself, his children, or his grandchildren living in proximity to one of these operations. Wetlands, water quality, not affected. We will have a 70% reduction in nutrient runoff from the existing agricultural operations. And we've submitted information that shows that post mining reclamation and water quality is exemplary. Archaeological, there's been some, some discussions about that. We conducted a phase 1A, actually expanded. There was one site that was investigated by the Smithsonian back in 1937, but they suspect because of, because of the river scour, there are no cultural deposits were found. That area was actually excluded from our special exception permit area in an abundance of caution. We also had our folks go back out. The, the consultants, the experts in this field go out and do additional research and no additional archaeological uh, sites were, were identified. Property values, I'm not going to read this statement, but you know Mr. Chris Kalo. He's an MIA appraiser and over 30,000 residential uh, appraisals and never have adjusted otherwise. 
tax. As I mentioned earlier, we've got over 70 facilities in Virginia. Filling out local tax returns is not something new to us. We pay over five and a half million in local property tax and equipment taxes. In Stafford County, our facility up there pays over $200,000 a year in local property and equipment taxes. We follow the methodology as provided by the Commissioner of Revenue with our estimates and with Virginia Department of Taxation. We've got a $10 million investment planned here. And the key differences between us and other examples is we do have a barge component. We do own our own equipment. We don't know what the other people are doing with those. We know that some of them are leased and whether they've got them properly reported on the tax rolls, we can't talk of that. Mr. Payne will talk about the comprehensive plan and the other elements. Mr. Payne, you're going you're gonna to need to summarize as quickly yeah, as we're, possible. We're, uh, we're simply going to go. This has already been addressed in the staff report, and obviously we have provided volumes of information regarding comprehensive plan compliance in our previous submissions, which I know is part of the record. Uh, again, uh, talking about the uh, comprehensive plan being a guide. And these are all matters that you've already had before you. Mr. Fincham has spoken about. Chairman, we'll, we'll, follow, we'll finish up this presentation just as Mr. Fincham indicated. This, is, this operation will move in increments around the site. And what you'll end up with is uh, about a 140-acre lake with a 100-foot wide grass zone around it, no-till. Uh, the rest of the area will be in agricultural. You'll have a, uh, uh, a lake that will be able to provide uh, water resource and, and uh, irrigation for the remaining agriculture and not have to be pumped from the river as it currently is. I've got a couple of quick pictures that I want to show you on reclamation, and then we'll finish this up. These are some of... Uh, Vulcan's experience with rec reclamation at post mining land use for back to agricultural uses. And I'm going to run through these very quickly. Give you some ideas of what we had. This is actually near the Potomac. That was created for a specific wildlife habitat there. And again, these ponds are great for, this is at Curl's Neck. The ponds that were created there are used for irrigation. And Dr. Lee Daniels, who is known as a preeminent expert in Virginia on the area of soil science and reclamation. Uh, he's been out and seen our operations, and that statement speaks for itself in his report as part of the application. Comes back to what kind of company you're going to have in your community, involvement, environmental stewardship. Here's our employees that were actually created a sturgeon reef on the James River, and that's the VCU Rice Center recognizing our marine group for that contribution. We've done extensive public safety training, and we involve our community and our school groups next door. This is part of a uh, facility that's right next door to one of our quarries and two school systems that we share a common boundary. I think we've hit on the conclusions, and I'll leave that with Mr. Penning. Mr. Chairman, I'll be quick and summarize uh, real quickly. Uh, as the board and chairman know, um, We've had lots of community support. We have close to 800 letters in support. The majority of these are from, these citizens are from Caroline County. We've got support from folks who are elected officials that, are, that know Vulcan and know their, their business model and their community efforts. Um, we also have some great uh, local flair, which I'm sure will present uh, their views tonight and others. Uh, who have written letters in support of this project, which we feel are extraordinarily beneficial uh, to, our, to, our, to our project. Um, in closing, and I know we have a time constraint here, but in closing... You've already just, passed the time constraint. If, if I may, just real quickly, Mr. Chairman. Just in closing, um, just want to talk real quick about the owner of the property, and I said I'd close with this, is the owner does matter, and I know that that is a priority for yours as well in balancing this process. The owner is a 30-year businessman farmer in this community, um, has fought, toiled, paid his taxes, invested, done what any person would do to try to promote and put forward his business. And it's a great story on Emmett Sneed in Sunday's paper talking about the challenges that farmers face and the great entrepreneurship 
of farmers. Farmers are the backbone of our rural communities. They are the business people in our, in our rural communities. Mr. Wachmeister is not asking for a handout. He's not asking for a subsidy. He's asking for the opportunity to utilize the assets he has in his ground to save his farm and provide for his family. That's about as American as it gets. And we are, and I am, uh, very excited about the opportunity for this project for not only my clients, but that for the county. I'm happy to answer any questions that board members may have. We have our consultants here. Uh, many of the Vulcan personnel here can answer tax issues, barge questions, uh, operation questions, etc. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank, Mr. You, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Um, we are not at this time going to ask you some questions or ask you any questions. What I, what I am going to ask you is that we would like to see your financial proposal in terms of what the county will receive. Um, I think we have something to that degree, but if you have anything else, we'd like to see that. And I don't believe we have a copy of that PowerPoint. Um, so if you could give us a copy of that PowerPoint, I'd appreciate it. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And, and the, the PowerPoint that is here, we gave to the county. You can keep that PowerPoint copy if that's... Okay, Mr. And, we have, and we have submitted our tax analysis and our financial analysis uh, okay. with our application material. So if you, I don't know if you want something else from you us. You feel comfortable with that? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. All right, we will uh, now continue with citizens' comments. Mr. Parton is going to take control of those. First name, first three names on the list are Gil Shelton. Oh, this is, she's speaking for Ms. Oh, Skinker. Okay, I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Bachmeister. You would come forward. And then you Gil Shelton. And uh, Gil Shelton following Ms. Bachmeister and then Bobby Chris. did open the public hearing, right? All right, before you go, Mrs. Wachmeister, there seems to be a question of whether I opened the public hearing or not. But just so we make sure I'm going to bang the gavel, the public hearing is open. Go right ahead. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. My name is Mary Shackelford Skinker, this lady right here. I am 88 years old, born, raised, and living right here in Caroline all of my life. After marrying my husband, B.M. Skinker, 65 years ago, I have resided at my home here on the farm that my husband's family has owned for hundreds of years. My farm is right here in Skinker's Neck, which, of course, was named after my family many years ago. Now that you know who I am, Let's get down to business. I fully support the entrepreneurial efforts of Albert Wachmeister to obtain his sand mining permit. Let me be absolutely clear. I support Albert. I support landowner property rights. I support working people. I support jobs and revenue to our county. And above all, I support Caroline County and the freedoms and liberties of the United States of America. My life experiences, seeing things happen that seemed impossible, have shaped my viewpoints. Experiences make a believer out of you. I'd like to share some of mine with you. I met Albert some 30-odd years ago. Over the years, I've seen Albert work tirelessly to turn what once was a neglected farm into what it is today. It cost him dearly. His back, knees, ankle, and wallet have all been broken in the dream to make that farm support his family. The high content of sand and gravel make farming that land expensive and difficult. It is not prime farmland by any means. It is time for that property to be what God made it to be, a sand mine. Albert's property rights as the landowner must be honored and respected. When we trample property rights, people are terribly affected for generations. I will explain. My father's name was Mr. Shackelford. He was a hardworking farmer and landowner. Our family farm was in Caroline County on what is now Fort A.P. Hill. One day in the 1940s, the federal government of the United States of America came along and told my father, the hardest working, most stubborn, and most loyal American, that his farm was no longer his. The government had seized it. 
I doubt, unless of course you happen to have lived through those times, that I can convince you that the 1940s were anything like today, but really, it wasn't that long ago. Abuses happened then, and they can happen again today. When you see these things happen for yourself, you come to the realization that there has to be a check on government power, and that check is the people. And that is why I am writing to you today. People have rights, and people need to stand up for their rights. I'm talking about the most important and fundamental rights, the right to speak, the right to vote, and the most important on the subject today, a landowner's property rights. We, as a people, need to recognize and respect the property rights of others. If we do not, I can tell you from experience that those rights will be lost. I ask you, the Board of Supervisors of Caroline County, to do the right thing and vote yes to Albert's application for his permit. Thank you. Respectfully. Mrs. Mary Skinker, Skinker's Neck, Rappahannock Academy, Virginia. Thank you. Ms. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wachmeister and Mrs. Skinker. Thank you. Next is Gil Shelton to be followed by Bobby Crisp, followed by Lowry Pemberton. Mr. Chairman, board members, I'm Gil Shelton from the Port Royal District. Uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity to comment on the special exception application for the sand and gravel mine. Uh, it, I, I, there's nothing personal in this at all insofar as I'm concerned. I met Mr. Wachmeister tonight for the first time. I um, don't know uh, all of the people at Vulcan or some of the top people at Vulcan, but I know they're very smart people. They're good at their business. Uh, before I, I begin my comments on the Black Marsh Mine that would violate seven of the nine general standards, I would like to uh, uh, present you with a letter. This is from the uh, Board of Directors and members of the Caroline County Countryside Alliance, and it's signed by the Board of Directors, uh, Carol Horton, Angus Muir, myself, Bill Wick, and Chan Corbin. The Board of Directors and members of the Caroline County Countryside Alliance strongly urge the Board of Supervisors to deny the, this request on the grounds that this area is designated for rural preservation and as a resource sensitive area under the Caroline County Comprehensive Plan. In addition, this project will do little or nothing to benefit the Caroline County citizens. Ultimately, it is likely to cost the county money and loss of resource sensitive land, water, clarity, and more. The mission of the, of the CCCA is to work with the county officials, citizens, and landowners to promote, protect the rural character of Caroline County, preserving the agricultural, scenic, natural, and diverse historical resources. We do not advocate the use of these resources for a select few, but for the benefit of the greater community and future generations. Uh, that, I, and I will present you with this letter, but that pretty much summarizes what the CCCA is all about. Basically, as a, as a director and a, as a founder of, uh, of CCCA, I am concerned with the comp plan created by literally hundreds of people working thousands of hours, and it would be seriously and permanently impaired by approval of this mine permit. It would be another bad precedent. We've seen a couple of them. I am sympathetic to the rule of law that requires the applicant to abide by the nine general standards for special exception permits. Historic preservation, archaeology, cemeteries, and 12,000 years of human history would all be set back or destroyed by this disfiguring mine. With regard to, to uh, archaeology and cemeteries, my wife and I have dug twice in Pompeii with the University of Virginia team digging uh, up a civilization about 2,000 years old. We have dug in the island of Amargos, Greece. Uh, the civilization there was about 3,000 years old, Mycenaean. Uh, I can tell you this, that you can walk over land. I've also <laughs> dug a little bit in AP Hill looking for cemeteries there. Uh, I can tell you this, that you can walk over land 
and you can say, hey, there's nothing here, there's nothing here. Hey, let's take a sample there, let's take a sample there. You don't know where the cemeteries are. You don't know where the graves are. And, and of course, it's illegal in this state and probably every state to uh, dig up graves and cemeteries. They simply ha it ha simply hasn't been explored. Uh, we did it at AP Hill with electronic instruments, and, and I, I just feel very badly about that. This hearing is about one person, uh, about whether one person or one, or one company should profit while hundreds of neighboring families suffer six days a week for a generation or more. It is also about Caroline not needing another mine. We have two mines in Caroline, one in Spotsylvania, all three operating at about 30 uh, percent. We do not need another mine. As I mentioned, there are nine general standards, all of which must be met by the applicants. The uh, Planning Commission studied, analyzed, and held hearings on the application for 75 days. They probably held seven or eight hearings. And they made their decision, and you heard their final recommendation. All right. Now, what I would like to do now is to go through the, the general standards all of these, or any of these that are not passed by the uh, applicant would, would make him ineligible to receive a special exception permit. General Standard 1, the use shall not adversely affect the character and the established pattern of development of the area in which it wishes to locate. Both the planning and agree that black mark Mr. Shelton I'm sorry your your time is up your time is up sorry my five minutes is up yes yes sir okay can you summarize Mr. Shelton I'm sorry could I summarize yes I can thank you I'm wordier than I thought At any rate, there were seven of the nine general standards that were violated. The Planning Commission and the Planning Department on at least two saw them. And the violations of the general standards that persuaded the Planning Commission to vote to recommend denial of the permit and the Board of Supervisors are absolute, they're clearly stated, and they are very simple to understand. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Would you like to give us your PowerPoint so we could have access to it later? You give it to us to you. I have oh. packages for you. You got it. Okay. Can Thank you make you. copies for us? Thank you. Next speaker is Bobby Crisp, be followed by Senator Lowry Senator Pemberton. Pemberton. I'm Bobby Crisp, and I'm a lot owner at Four Winds and a taxpayer in Caroline County now for 22 years. I'm a lifetime uh, resident uh, of this area. I have a farm over in Stafford County on the Rappahannock River. I can see uh, the Four Winds tank just down the road from my house in Stafford. Um, I'm a biologist, I'm a school teacher, park naturalist, and serve on the Tri-County City Soil and Water Conservation Board for six years as director and chairman. Now as an associate director and educator. My family loves Four Winds in Caroline County. The peace and tranquility, the beauty of nature, <laughs> with Pettigrew Wildlife Refuge and rural farm fields surrounding us. I have some major concerns about Vulcan's sand and gravel barges and the potential for serious tugboat and barge accidents along our precious and narrow Rappahannock River. Barges and tugboats are a source of accidents and one of the largest sources in U.S. maritime industry, 1,500 to 2,000 per year, and some um, uh, very deadly. In um, September 1993 in Mobile, Alabama, a tugboat pushing barges hit the railroad bridge, collapsing part of it. An Amtrak train with 220 people aboard derailed and fell from the bridge to the water below. 47 people died by drowning and burning to death, and 103 were injured. 
In September of 2001, Padre Island, Texas, Queen Isabella Causeway, a tugboat pushing barges hit the bridge and collapsed 160 feet of it. Eight people died when their cars fell into the river. In July of 2007, Louisville, Kentucky on the Ohio River, a tugboat hit an 18-foot fishing boat under partially foggy conditions. The captain said neither he nor any crew member ever saw that boat. Six fishermen died. There were no survivors. In July of 2010, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Delaware River, a barge hit and sank a 33-foot tourist duck boat with 37 people having fun aboard. The tugboat captain was on his cell phone and forgot to set lookouts. The duck boat was stationary in the water with engine failure and no one on the tug saw it. Two people died and 35 were rescued. May 2011, Virginia, the James River, shipping lane, the tugboat and fishing boat collided. Both operators cited by Coast Guard for traveling at an unsafe speed. A 13-year-old boy in the fishing boat was killed in the collision. The moral of these tragic events, tugboats and barges are dangerous and deadly, even in deep, wide rivers and coastal waters. Where Hello, Rappahannock River, with literally thousands of recreational and fishing boats, including kayaks, canoes, water skiers, John boats and inner tubes, tugboats and barges become even more dangerous and more deadly. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and that's what I call a summary. Okay, and we can have a copy of your PowerPoint also. Next speaker is Lowry Pemberton to be followed by Richard Moncure and then Alan Howard. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and Board. My name is Lowry Pemberton, and I am a concerned citizen of Sharps, a small village in Richmond County. The river is not only in my backyard, but has been the foundation of my youth. My family for generations and many others have used the body of water for business and pleasure. And to think that our safety would be put in further jeopardy calls for much concern. I will be talking about incidences that have occurred from June 2011 to June 2010 with barges. In the Chesapeake Bay, Virginia, Two barges broke free from mooring and hit the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. No injuries, but there was a vast amount of, of damage. May 2011, Mississippi River, Mississippi. Several loads, loaded large barges broke free and hit a bridge. One sank, no injuries, but vast damage. May 2011, James River shipping lane. A young boy was killed. May 2011, New Orleans, Louisiana. Underway barge hits bridge prohibiting car travel, no injuries, but vast damage. March 2011, Mississippi River, Mississippi. Several barges hit the Mississippi Bridge. Two sank, no injuries, but vast damage. October 2010, Texas Houston Shipping Channel. Tugboat hits electrical tower, closing channel for three days. $1 billion in economic and property loss. September 2010, Kanawana, West Virginia. Barge hits fishing boat with six on board who luckily escaped before the barge hit. No injuries but property loss. 2000, July 2010, Delaware River, Pennsylvania. Barge hits two were killed and 35 were rescued. July 2010, Mississippi River, Tennessee. Two barges collided, releasing toxic fumes. Three were hospitalized. June 2010, Tennessee River. Tugboat hits broken down fishing boat, killing two out of three members on board. Approximately 1,500 to 2,000 tugboats and barge incidents happen each year, and most occur on rivers much wider, deeper, and less crowded than our Rappahannock River. It would be a great mistake to be, bring more traffic into our small, busy waterway. I'm testi I, te I can testify after a waterman went missing last night from my community. Getting rescue and helicopters to, an area, to our area is no easy task. The young man went missing at 7 p.m. last night, and I was, I was on search the whole night. He was later found this morning at 7 a.m., he was completely fine, but the helicopters that were supposed to find him—15 seconds remaining. The helicopter that was supposed to find him last night did not show up until 9:30 this morning. 
With more potential accidents, this will create a life-threatening issue. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next speaker is Richard Moncure. Be followed by Alan Howard and John Tippett. My name is Richard McCure, Jr. I reside at Simonson's in Richmond County. I'm the title Rappahannock River steward for Friends of the Rappahannock. Like Mr. Payne, I call this river my home and have had generations of family living along it and, that are, and many that are now buried there. I hope to speak for the hardworking watermen who are resting tonight to face all the difficult challenges that life on the Rappahannock will present tomorrow. Not to mention what may come if black marsh is transformed into Vulcan sand and gravel mine. Seeing how our resources have become so precious, I commend Caroline County for developing a comprehensive plan that recognizes and grants special protections for the Rappahannock River Corridor, which plays such an important role in our quality of life and the livelihood of those who depend upon its waters. In my time as, on the river as a waterman, it was easy to see the fishermen and their families' clear connection to the health of the river. In the gathering of opinions at the docks regarding barge traffic, I've heard a variety of stories. Barge captains clipping crab pots like of crab pot floats like playing a Pac-Man game, pumping out bilges directly into the river to cut weight, cutting channel markers to make quicker time, and clearing decks to alert directly into the river to beat the clock. Many watermen expect to lose at least one gill net per year. Oh, I apologize on my slideshow. At, valued at $300 per gill net. Pound nets fished in similar locations cost thousands of dollars. But these stories are not for me to tell firsthand. My story takes place uh, in Lower Carolina County, parts of Upper Essex. Uh, one early spring morning on our way to the net, we made way for a barge that was barreling down the river. The tug's propulsion made a mud line directly to our net and through our net. It was completely destroyed. We retrieved what we could, followed after the tug for compensation. But after waving our net markers and circling the barge, we didn't get a reaction from the pilot house. At this, the captain of my boat began untying the window weights from his foreclosed-on family home that we were using to weight our net and launched them at the side of the tug. Harmlessly, they fell back into the river, but not without, the, without earning the attention of the barge pilot, who was waving a shotgun at us, laughing. The captain of my, of my boat dropped it out of gear, sat on a bucket, and bawled. The next week, I was at work in the family business, washing dis dishes at the restaurant. In conclusion, these barge and tug accidents are already happening in the Rappahannock. Even the best pilots find themselves at the mercy of strong winds and flushing tides common to the river. Too often we see barges banked on the mud flat in this part of the Rappahannock, hopelessly waiting for the wind to die or the tide to swell. As the population of this region continues to grow, the likelihood of a horrific accident such as we've seen in other parts of the country is only more likely to happen here. If barge traffic presents these type of persistent and deadly dangers on, a wi on wider rivers, how much more risky remain. is inviting them to a river so narrow that the length of the rig is often wider than the river itself? And what happens when the precedent is set for more barge traffic to ply these rivers, shared with anchored watermen, fishing nets, and lines, lines, or jet skis with inflatable tubes and children tailing behind? What happens when the next mine opens, then the next? Well, I will tell you, we will turn a river that supported a diversity of local uses, local watermen, and Whose barges Can you summarize, traffic, please? Yes, sir. Whose barge traffic grows to dominate the river and exclude the local, local uses that are part of the paradise of Caroline County. Okay. Make no mistake that this is a precedent-setting decision. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, again, when, when Mr. Parton says 15 seconds, it, it's probably time to summarize. But we are trying to give everybody three minutes, and if you take longer, we won't be able to do that. Next, Alan Howard, John Tippett, and then Timothy Watson. <clears throat> okay. My name is Alan Howard. Board, board, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you tonight. My name is Alan Howard, and I live at 21627 Tidewater Trail and the wonderful Rappahannock Academy, Virginia. I'm here tonight because I am very concerned about the proposed mine on Black Marsh Farm. I've lived about three miles from the proposed site for about over 40 years. 
the Rappahannock Rivers and its historical value and natural resources are very important to me and my family. We all know the beauty of the river, the animals, and the understanding and significance of historical artifacts. As a businessman for many years in this county, I understand the importance of industry. I invite new businesses to the area, especially the Port Royal District, because of our resource sensitive zoning, the mine is not the typical or type of business that we need to help stimulate our economy or come into the county. Although, the, although these 14 proposed employees, there is no guarantee that, that, that these employees will be from Caroline County or be Caroline County residents. In addition, the county would also lose money with the damage done to the river with the decrease in value of the property. Property values will decrease. Balkan states that all products will be transported by barge along the Rappahannock River up to the Potomac River. If approved, this would in infringe upon all our neighbor neighboring counties with the transportation of materials extracted from our county. Although Vulcan claims that there will be no truck traffic, there will have to have fuel, equipment, maintenance, and employees to function, so there will be some impacts on road in already poor conditions. I fear that this mine will interfere with Haymont and bring in people to live in, and, and bringing in people to live in that area. None of us want to live next to a mine, so please vote against this proposal, proposed mine. This isn't the business we need in Caroline County. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next is John Tippett, representing an organization, uh, Timothy Watson, and then Kay Watson. Mr. Tippett, you're with Friends of the Rappahannock, correct? Yes, sir. That's your organization. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. Uh, my name is John Tippett, and I'm executive director of the Friends of the Rappahannock. We uh, work throughout the Rappahannock River watershed. We're headquartered at Fall Hill Avenue in Fredericksburg. Uh, issues like this one that we're discussing tonight uh, often become something of a, a tennis match of uh, expert opinions. Uh, one side serves up a case with data, and another one lobs uh, contradictory opinions back from their own experts. And so it continues back and forth. Uh, you're getting enough of dueling data sets. And so tonight, I simply want to share with you our concerns by asking you the same question that our board asked itself as we researched this issue. And that question, quite simply, is what kind of Rappahannock River and River Valley do we want to pass along to our great-grandchildren? And we quickly realized that this question is much bigger than Black Marsh, and yet Black Marsh is also intimately related to the future of the river and the valley, because what we're talking about here is the slippery slope of that most dangerous of words, precedent. This decision is about much more than one mine, because as you well know, Caroline's floodplains are full of these sediments. And once you have made the decision to allow one riverfront mine with barge transport, it becomes much more difficult to say no to the next and to the next. What we're talking about is a slope that leads toward industrialization of the river corridor. And that's what we at Friends of the Rappahannock oppose. And we would simply ask of you, uh, do you want to see an industrialized Rappahannock River corridor? Are the limited benefits that you stand to gain for the county worth the long-term costs to those treasured but more abstract quality of life benefits that a natural river corridor provides? And there are a lot of industrial impacts we can talk of, but let's just focus on one, the barging. Um, you might uh, say, surely barging can coexist with other river uses. But as we've uh, heard over the past few speakers, uh, we see that barging has a lot of serious implications, especially on smaller rivers. Let's take a moment to visualize what um, we think might reasonably expect 
on the Rappahannock as we move down the slippery slope of more and more barge 